Yeah, that's a structure. Yeah. Being it's so five o'clock. All this stuff. Being it's five o'clock, I'd like to call the planning commission mm -hmm. meeting to order. Change the agenda chat. Okay. Look for a motion to adopt the agenda. I'll so move. I'll second that. Uh, Motion's made and seconded. All in favor? All right. Jamie's here. Opposed? Oh, okay. Sorry. Make the approval of the May 27th meeting minutes. I would look for approval of it. I'll make motion. I'll second it. Motion made and second to approve the May 27th meeting. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Which is carried. Chad, you want to take that request for the murals? Yep, I'll just kind of lead into it. Um, we've had another request for a mural project. Uh, Susan Polson and Spencer Young, right? Um, is here with the Wolf River Art League uh, to kind of give you an uh, update of their next uh, concept. So, yeah, if you guys want to sit around at microphones so we catch your, uh, your voice, that would be awesome. Um, I'm Susan, and I'm just, I've been in here many times for the murals. Um, and we have been hoping that Spencer would be a part of the Wolf River Art League for the past year or two. And he just came forward this year and decided that he would like to be a part of it. Um, the reason why we really wanted him um, to be a part of it is because of his love of art. Um, I've actually known him since he was a little boy. He, he's not that little, but <laughs> <laughs> he's a gentle giant. Um, he's from Shy Acton, so he's fairly local and he still lives in the area. You guys might know of his work, uh, from the news, he has painted the Lambeau Field or Lambeau Fence. The Packer Fence is right across Lambeau Field. So he does that. Is that every year? Yep, annually so far. Annually, and he does other projects for other communities um, throughout the Fox Valley or wherever he needs to be. I think he's finishing something up in the UP right now. Um, it would be a benefit to have Spencer part of our group, not only because of his talent, but his love of art. And he had come up with a idea that he would like to do a revolving art piece. So uh, for now, the murals that we've done so far have been, um, they're painted pretty permanently on the buildings and they should stay there for years to come. He wants a smaller average size wall that he can change once a month or something like that. And he could start just this next month um, and maybe get three or four murals in this year yet, uh, weather depending. So I'll hand it over to Spencer and he can continue. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Spencer, as Susan mentioned. Um, I actually do this full time as a living. Uh, kind of took a chance on myself uh, six years ago. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it was a pretty, pretty big leap for me. I used to work in the office corporate setting as a graphic designer for Oshkosh Defense and it just wasn't my thing. And I decided, you know, I want to be an artist is what I always wanted to be when I was younger. And I was going to pursue that dream. Um, I was lucky enough to paint the Packer Pony fences outside of Lambeau Field. And it's been helping my business ever since. It's blossomed into something amazing. Not a lot of people can say they could do this for a living. And I'm very blessed to be in this situation. Um, with that being said, I know I've talked to Season for the past couple of years about you know, ideas and the potential of coming out here and installing mural work. And the one opportunity that I just keep thinking of is to have something that changes um, a monthly kind of situation where we could do something different. It appeals to not only people from this area, but we can catch attention to other people who would love to travel this area just to even see mural work and not only just the mural, but other great things in the community. So I have plenty of ideas. Of, I would say a lot of my ideas with the Packers fence has uh, gained national attention, uh, ESPNs, Sunday Night Football, as well as other of my works that have reached a national level as well. So this could be another opportunity right here. So, and I'd love to work with everyone here. So where, where are you thinking of the- uh, The wall that I have in mind for Spencer would be um, the Anytime Fitness Building on the north end of town. Um, Anytime Fitness just purchased the end, like I think it used to be Huber Shoes and it's Star Communications. So they, they purchased 
that end of the building and it would be the south wall that faces clock yep um i don't know the exact dimensions but it's a well spencer's like seven foot tall so he can reach the top and he can you know get the width to um uh nope the other end the other side yep due to the rules dave would we have to approve get in there year? yeah That's that trailer's blocking it but that that wall there mission does um it's a nice block wall it will be easy to transform for him um i just i think spencer also being on the art league he's uh willing to take the wolf river art league in his work and also the city of new london and it's just good for everybody there's there's it's a win-win it promotes my artwork as well as um, I, I have a I would like to say I have a pretty popular presence on social media as well. So whenever I comment on my work, uh, celebrities, I've worked with plenty of clientele that's fairly popular, I would say. Um, you you have examples of your work or like what does your work um, look like if you had to like paint a picture verbally, I guess. My website is www foreveryoungdesigns.com. I have a lot of my work on there in a gallery as well as a shop page. Um, it ranges between anything and everything. I like painting uh, celebrities, athletes, uh, cartoon characters, uh, anime characters, uh, pretty much, like I said, anything. And Wide everything. variety. Yeah. Um, so what we're, we're asking is that instead of like we've done in the past where we come forward and we show you um, each mural that's going to be hung and you vote on each mural that we don't have to come for each one of like that it will be known that it's going to be a good decision or a good you know topic for for the mural um unfortunately i don't think we can avoid that the way the rules are written because if he would do something subjective we're going to take the heat for it so without approval from the commission i don't think that's going to be possible. is there a Just way the way the rules are written is there a way to do it with um, is there a way to do it without um him being at the meeting like if he if he, I think we could pre-approve if he had a whole be. bunch of them. We could pre-approve. It's them. just time consuming to you know to get here and yep. do all this and when I it's. That. We probably yeah. don't want to you know ever so, go through this. Yeah. With you. So if we if he came up with his next two ideas and submitted them by email you or something, however you prefer, you could do that. And I don't think you would have to be here. Right. Okay. No, the, I like I would like to be presented like guidelines, and then that way, you know, I come up with a design, and then I know that will work for sure. If not, then you guys let me know, and I'll go back to the drawing board. And we have everything on Zoom too, so if we okay. had to have you, and if you're, you know, wherever two hours work. away, we could bring you up on Zoom real easy if we had questions. Excellent. Okay. If you would know a month ahead of time or something, what you're going to be doing the next month, right. would give up I'm sure he of, can think ahead of time and run it that's by. That's usually how I am. It's like with my line of work as well. It's a, it's a chess game. That's how I look at it. I'm always thinking like five moves ahead. So yeah. if you need something in a month, I'll probably have it a month beforehand. So you have something, Dave? Yes. Uh, I don't know. Do we, do we need a motion to? Well, this is the the conceptual design that was brought forward. Um, for the first for the first one so um you know th th this is kind of what and i don't kind of explain who this is because I, I don't think everybody knows uh who. he's actually um he's a comedian that specifically focused on the midwest charlie barons um, and he's from wisconsin yes uh i believe whitefish bay um i've done work for him in the past and this is nothing with me working with him this is just me like hey i like his work i'd like to paint him on the wall and with that being said, my social media presence, if this is something he sees, he would share on his IG and as well as take the Wolf River Art League. And the city. You know, I think and we need to be careful with these type of things. I think this moves past the scope of a mural. This could get into advertising. You know, you're basically promoting this comedian. So we may be in a legal, I don't know. I mean, like if you would paint Scooby-Doo if there's a trademark on there, I don't know what type of a law and what the city is going to be involved in. So I think we should look at this in a legal standpoint from a, uh, I'd like advice from an attorney. 
before we approve something, because if we would go forward with this and somebody says, hey, I want Donald Trump on the side of my building, we're not going to be able to tell him no. And I don't know what the repercussions are to that. So I don't know what the interpretation of a mural is to what advertising and, and where that line is. So I oh. guess I would like definition from that just for okay. clarity. I, I'm not saying I'm opposed to it by any means. Yep. I'm just saying I'd like to know if the city is going to be. I'm just, I was just going to ask Spencer, maybe he knows a little bit of how other communities might handle this or I have. Mean, my experience from the Green Bay Packers fence, this hasn't been an issue at all because at the end of the day, it's been a community effort yep. versus, I mean, I'm not making any money off of this. And I, right. I want to make that very clear. Like for me, this is just promoting myself as an artist and not only like putting something cool out there, but you know, there's going to be people driving by. Oh, I'm going to stop here. That looks sweet. Let's take a picture by it. And that's the most rewarding thing for me at the end of the day. And not only that, I get to improve my art skills. Who? Okay. And who would be um, opposed or who would be legally opposed to this? You mean this guy? Because like if he has his permission, I, I is that a thing? That's what I'm saying is I don't know. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, Susan and I kind of emailed a little bit back and forth on this one. Um, just kind of adds the questions. Um, obviously, Charlie, and this would be promoted as business. So the question does rise. Um, is it a mural? Yes. But is it an advertisement too? You know, so, and Dave and I were kicking on back and forth trying to talk about this in the office. So number one, if there was a political party, Donald Trump, you know, or, or Joe Biden, someone wanted to paint that on a mural, is that a mural or is that a political right. ad? So, well, we also have a rule with the Art League that we aren't painting anything other, other politically, except for, um, you know, what we painted at the vet. That's the Art League, but say, yeah. the, say the Republican Party in town wants to come up and do a mural of a candidate. Well, if we allow this, is that going to open the door for that? Or and I've seen um, billboards with Karen Gethin, for example, with her image and the same. If she, if she wants to do a mural in town, is that a mural or an advertisement billboard? So, and that's right. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not clear. Yeah. So, so, what the Art League is doing is phenomenal. Okay. And this is starting to we're going on charge territory, so we got to figure it out. I guess I got, I got a question. I guess I'm unfamiliar with if that anytime fitness is a private thing, why are we going to see it? Yeah. How does that work? The, the city has a sign ordinance. So all signage has to be regulated by the sign ordinance. And back in the day, they determined that murals are, are signed, quasi signed. So instead of trying to develop a bunch of regulations, because murals are kind of all over the place. And whatever, yeah. Um, I think back in the day, they just said, okay, any type of mural, which is kind of like a sign, would just come up to the planning commission for review. And approval. I thought that I found the clause in there that said um, art was exempt from that. Any, it was line um, nine, I believe. What's that? Anything painted on the wall was not considered a sign. It was exempt. It was line nine, I think. And I ran that by you for some reason at one point already, but. Uh, and then kind of going back to the advertising as well. Um, it's a kind of living. Anything that I put on the wall could be considered advertising just because it's my way of living. So I don't know if that's going to make a difference at all in this situation, but I'm just looking at it from another perspective as well. I could paint, uh, but the moment I like post it online on social <laughs> Yeah, like that's part of my job that's like part of that so he's normally a paid artist um but not being paid by us at all he's still here um because he wants to be have you ever had anything to the green bay where you're on that fence i mean that that's the factor right and that's we've never had any issues in the past six years with them we've actually raised money and this is stuff where maybe in the future this could be a possibility too it's uh Last year, we with the pandemic and everything, we ended up raising over seven thousand dollars to get to the Green, Greater Green Bay Community Fund, and that was just private donations that we made for the fans, and we painted the fans on the fence. You know, it's just what art can do is truly something amazing, and not only that, it helps the community, and that's what I'm all about at the end of the day. If this is something like, hey, someone can look at it, it's a cool piece, or we can make it into something where we can help the community. I'm all for whatever you guys think. So. And the Packers don't own that. Right? No, okay. it's a it's private owned, and this is I would I would say it's the same thing. It's a private owned yeah. as well. So 
I don't want to be a big guy. I kind of like, like Jason said, maybe we've got to ask somebody. And, and, well, I would just like to hear what the city attorney has to say. Yeah. Is that something, something that. you can do fairly quickly, or like how? What's the time frame on that? To get um, Spencer going, do you have a second idea that? I mean, this is something new territory for us. Right. We have to look into that. Yeah. Is there a second idea that you have back uh, that they could approve tonight to get going? This? Not at the moment. I don't. But, um, I like the keeper moving. <laughs> He's a really fun comedian. Yes. And I, I like the idea of cleaning that up because hopefully, yeah, that building, it's going to be a get rid of all that decoration that's fucked around it. You know, it'll be great. Some, but not uh, all the Do you have it? I do think it's a good idea to uh, be run by the attorney. And I'm working with him right now with another thing, so I don't think it'd be a big stretch to run that by him. Just get his opinion. Do you have it somewhere handy? Yeah, we just don't want to hold it right there. <clears throat> oh. Pandora's box. So that could Side of the too, is all the idea of possibility of basis yeah. reality. Two or three concepts that we were kind of going around that maybe one of the other ones so point maybe make it easier. We could probably prove that the time to go to the a little bit of time. Um, so this, this is the only thing I like to do. And I know I have I have some sketches in my sketchbook. I just have to one down. I'm sure there's an appropriate design that would work, but I don't think it would be an issue to send something over as soon as tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, he's a commodity for the gentleman's drink, and so late. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think at the end of the day, like, if I post this work, um, I know a lot of Packer players have said it, it's more of an appreciation, like fan art, yeah. you know, and that's not that's kind of how I look at it. It's fan art because, like, at the end of the day, you know, we're not making any money, I'm yeah. not. It's just more that it's fun and it's out there. People can enjoy it as much as I do. Everybody can have a fun. It is. And it's nobody, nobody forgets what you're doing by any means. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so Carols or yep. other artwork yes. judged by planning commission. Signs shall be exempt from this section. Correct. So it's not a sign. Yeah, so that means that that's included after the closed record. Yeah, because there has to be a proof. There's a ton of different regulations on signs. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's not it's exempt, it's not considered a sign for the for the code. Okay. I haven't mentioned the season with that design, the one thing that may be that could be removed is the keeper moving part because that is their logo. And that one I said I'm gonna go with the take out of there. And I think you would avoid any issue right there. My experience at least just because it's you know yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a trademark logo. <laughs> right? But I can do my own interpretation of keep your moving. It's just it's an artist's interpretation. So if you're taking something that's totally 100 percent brand standard and it's the it's the logo to the teeth, then there might be an issue. But if I make it my own art, art interpretation, then there's no issue with it. It's gotta be so much of a percentage. Exactly. And uh I can't remember what it was. It changes every year. I, I'm also a graphic designer full time, and I think it was at like seventy percent or something. That was older in our work, so yeah, that was probably we went up. Uh, 
and him sent something to us a month or so ahead of time with put on the wall and it improved. But well, there's a couple of definitions. Number one, for any of the changing of the artwork, if we can get that on a regular basis um, in advance, we can just throw it on the event that you guys are going to unless it's Okay. I think mean, the other issue is, you know, uh, this. I think we need to know where our boundaries are and what's acceptable and what's not through a legal statement. Because the attorney says, you know, this is what you need to stay away from. We can actually kind of identify that then yeah. at a legal standpoint and, and show that to you and say, well, this is. You know, in the future, this is kind of what we have to stay in the scope of it, and this is what we have to stay away from by the advisement of the attorney. I guess that's kind of what I'm looking for. Because murals, I mean, when they probably created the ordinance, I mean, murals was just, right. you know, a very small item. I mean, you guys brought this, you know, those are huge. So, um, I mean, just because it, it's becoming such a large and great thing, it's opening up the door, and we're, we're on uncharted territory right now. So, it's up to the commission to see what you guys can do with this. So I would propose that maybe for now put this design concept on the back burner, get seek approval. In the meantime, I can come up with something that's more, you know, nothing you have to worry about trademark, maybe something wildlife every day that you see. So it's not going to be no issue there. You know, I even urge you to come up with four or five. And maybe you would approve all five of them and then that would be is this would not come back for five months, right? Is this something that he can Work on to get started in July because <laughs> he was hoping to get started in July. Well, we get to approve them. Yeah. Can you approve them outside of today? You'd have to have a special meeting. Right? That'd be public. Is, is that something that can be done? Or, I mean, is he not going to be able to start until August? Commission has to determine if they want to have a special meeting in a week, week or two, you know, other than the regular meeting, which would be next regular scheduled meeting, which would be uh, 22nd. Is there, Thursday, Thursday. is there an idea we can kind of agree on today, even if it doesn't need a visual, but the elements are in there? And then, I mean, I could always send something over, and then that could be approved, but as long as the base idea and concept is approved. I mean, the, the, the mural concept just has to be a kind of destination for yeah. Wildlife, that's like the first thing that comes to mind, especially being from Shyack and like I was sort of like sand and crane, sturgeon. If there's something here that we could highlight, I could pick that as well. So, the little wildlife thing, I would think. Yeah. yeah. Um, sturgeon would be great because we get the sturgeon rolling. Okay. So why don't we go with the sturgeon then for the very first concept? Everybody trying to look to switch for a tentative. You would approve the motion right now based on the concept, the conceptual design to do the wildlife slash sturgeon you know, theme mural on this book. And then you can rock and roll with that. And then we're next one. At the end of the next month's meeting, we can look at more concepts from other designers. I'll have like four or five concepts. Including this one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'll get you Chad's information and then. Excellent. And I hope you're not discouraged. I mean, this is just new for us. I mean, what the Wolf of Harvey did to like, or the Crystal Clear, the Boston stuff, highlighting New London, bringing you on board, great things. This is just new for us. We don't want to get ourselves a can of worms that, you know, also we do have someone who wants to come up with a political ad or, right. you know, advertising stuff. So. Damn, that's. But I, I will try to avoid as well too. Like if you guys, if that's a concern, that I am with it. Like if I had pink wildlife on that wall for a whole year every month, that I'd have no issues <laughs> whatsoever. So <laughs> not wildlife. Bro. Yeah, I just like painting. That's all. So I think this is really good stuff. So you know, if someone wants to make that motion tonight, something. Can I can I bring up a point? Yep. Is uh, New London home of the American water spaniel or something like that? Correct. So, yeah, I, I'm just throwing that out for an idea. Um, I mean, we we are always a, a community of, of fishing and sturgeon and stuff. Um, there's just a different idea of maybe highlighting that high hot. Excuse me, highlighting um, that animal. That's all. I just my two cents. 
even um, having something seasonal that fits with that month. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, with the sturgeon spawn, um, that specific month, you paid a sturgeon that month, uh, whitetail, deer hunting season, paid a whitetail on the wall. You know, the, it's it's pretty much endless with the possibilities you could go that, that would fit that month, so. Our festival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we got, so you wanna make a motion to I would make that motion that Spencer be allowed to create art. Well, like, Do you want that specific building? Yes. At whatever that anytime, address is, anytime Shano, fitness. Shano Street. Anytime Fitness. Yep, 1111 Shano. Yeah, uh, home of Anytime Fitness uh, with plan commission to approve all artwork. Second motion. Motion made and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, start painting. Excellent. Yay. Thank you guys. I appreciate your time okay. today. Thanks Dave and I will talk to legal and just talk about, you know, especially with this type of um, scenario, is there a way that this could be defined that it's not a sign <laughs> or it's or it's not going to set us up to be like our political ad, you know, thing. So we'll talk about that to see if this you know, in a legal sense, is not going to open up the door for us for any, right. Do you think that we, maybe we should be looking at that part of our ordinance the, and with that includes murals that we do something there? I mean, instead of... We could create more parameters yeah. for the murals so we don't have to approve them. Right. You know, we right. could have a, a <laughs> section, no, I mean, we could I'm, have a mural section in our ordinance yes. that the council could approve. Okay. And then we wouldn't have to do this. Every we could time. have, you know, wildlife murals are approved in the city of London. Right. So as long as it meets those parameters, Whatever you guys don't need approval. Are. You already yeah. have I mean, that, that way we wouldn't have to be doing this every time. Or, or it might just be an internal thing that no. we just get a, you know, uh, approval from the building inspector. I mean, that could be you know, right. so it's a quicker process yeah. just okay. to, kind of, to record where this stuff is happening. But um, yeah, I that mean, would that be could great. all be, you know, redefined. And if you guys have ideas on how we'd like to see that defined, okay. let me know. Okay. These are the parameters that would work for us to help define make the process easier. Okay, thank you. Uh, when you break it up or whatever, you can uh, mess with your phone. You can get it together. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a corner lot. So long. Uh, the owners came in and we spoke. They came up with two different options. Um, the only options we have to look at are the ones that run along the Orange Street side up past the edge of the house. On the Laura side, these are obviously chain link. So if you look where the, maybe the dots are, that's the only part of the fence that we like to prove and already approved the solid fence going up at those two points. So all three of these that we have today are uh, chain link fence. I think they're all three black chain link. They're looking to, uh, as you see, they have a very small backyard that they'd be able to take us for their animals, mostly. Obviously, they might have option one to just give a larger area. That's the role. Is there a potential sidewalk in this area at all? I was going to say it got stabbed right away, wouldn't it? It's far enough back where it's not in that triangle that could create additional obstruction and it's, it's open anyway. You can have by practical purpose. Because it's not a 
does it have to be one foot off the property line? Yep. No. So even if and I I can have put this in so that and they know that it's got to be one foot off. <laughs> I don't think we'll handle all three of these separately, so we'll probably do it. Start with one of the gold and all three separately. Any objections to the one on the last three? Regarding sidewalk, I don't see much in that area already. <laughs> it's right here. And if a sidewalk was ever put in, they would need to actually move. Yeah, obviously, we'd have to have them move their fence. Well, but would you? I mean, we would stay in the right of way anyway. Yeah, if, it, if it's one one foot inside their property line, that right of way would be just fine. Yeah, it should be. Should be. And we usually you know, we usually put the sidewalk within a foot. So there's a lot of times it's it's on one foot on our side of the property line, so the right of the line. Anyway, so. This is a four foot or eight foot fence. I didn't see that. It's a four foot. Four foot. Yeah. And chain link fences come in 48 inch. So since they meet the open, we have it. Uh, I believe our ordinance specifically said it does exclude four year points. I think that's the support post, if I remember correctly. So I think you can still have the support inch support post and have the side I think that's something we need to revisit, obviously, because. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think it looks really nice. The 42 probably came from just the full language possible. I think it's actually 42. Right. I mean, they did this section of the border. So I think it said the support post for this or 40. I think they still get the fence up there. Well, I think if I were neighbor to this property, I would prefer option two. Why, why, why do you say that? I mean, it's Lawrence Street. Uh, I don't know. I it's just a going. Line. I know just looking and going there and then drove by several times and. You know, and I like Beacon Avenue because you barely know it. And so I just, I'm just, if I were a neighbor, I'd like to. So, but I suppose we just, uh, someone wants to make a motion on option one, obviously, but that doesn't pass. And then uh, option two, uh, that doesn't pass on option no option to it. There's no issues with option one. Personally, I don't because they don't have a neighbor on that that side of that fence would be so it wouldn't you know necessarily no, it's the street. It's yeah, across the street. Side there, so. Most of us set back a little bit so I look for some of the motion to start off with option one for the one fifteen bar street. It's yeah, right. Question How come we're like we have three of these fences as far as what part of our ordinance isn't in line, you know, with that we have to keep doing this with these fences? I mean, we got it the last week and now three this time. And um, I mean, is there something that we need to change in the ordinance that? Or is our these just special situations that we need to address each time? My intention is to revamp the entire zoning ordinance. Fences have kind of been at the forefront recently, and I think a lot of these have been, have been hidden and installed without. Um, I think that's it. And the only reason it's here is it is because it's in the front yard, correct? Right. Is this for the for the same reason it's up some parameters that would allow the front yard without having to go to the planning commission? Does this pose a, a risk to our a risk to our firefighter? Is that is that a thought? 
And I'm just looking to see why they may have restricted the, the areas of the, the fences. Is there any any ordinances that have gates at so many feet or something like that for the kind of natural ordinance or Open fences may be constructed with a front setback or a corner side yard, or maybe the crew of the planning commission is the fences they'll have some support posts, support posts, not exceeding 40 inches away from the number of inches. That's good for something that I don't know. There's approved fences that are not in compliance with our ordinance. I think we're opening ourselves out. I mean, You said we did have an incident when we had a bad storm. We did have um, electrical contact with the firemen on that. We also had a couple of potential fires due to, to that storm. Um, and, um, eventually started fires on the So as far as firemen responding, concerning that. Well, that, that was my thought, you know, because if you're not protruding past the front of the house, is that something that they look at as, as far as an entrance and that kind of stuff. Entrance restrictions, I should say. Well, it looks like we should be looking at changing the ordinance. We don't like Susie says have these coming up every. Well, I don't say that we, I mean, what's the reasoning? I guess for that they put it in the way that they did. I mean, right. are we missing something? And then if we're going to... Why are we making an exemption? If we have rules, it should be fine. Well, I don't know that you're making an exemption as long as it's fit, because it doesn't say you can't have a fence. Right. It just says you got to come to get a pool. Well, you we have to take care of the height because you will come into a position planting. And they might have, I mean, they're pretty common. Yeah. Created. I mean, you go anywhere in the country, and they, and they would become energized, but I don't think they'd become energized because they're 48, so 40, etc. Or that says 40. And Jamie, like you said, points well taken. This is why we're here to make the decisions on an individual basis. I mean, that's what we look at. One of the other issue is it's for their animals. I'd much rather see that fence up and containing the animals than the animals getting out and causing issues that way too. Maybe they're more for security, you know, break ins and people running around and and stuff. Maybe that's why we're all of a sudden. Well, the design of the house, the way it sets on the property, have a ton of options. I'd like to propose a motion for option two. Yeah. And the reason being is that leaves the front entrance open for safety reasons uh for easier access and, and it's also meeting them in the middle to to help work with them on their animals i mean I, I think that's a serious consideration that we need to look at as well and, and i under i understand what you're saying but what if what if they're willing to put a gate in there a gate in the uh, option, option one? one my my thought process behind that is it's going all the way up to the front door and basically three quarters of their front entrance way besides their garage. Mm -hmm. And they also have to give us access to the electric meter. So they would have to put a gate in yeah. at some point they could lock it, but they would have to give us access. Sure. So they can't limit us. They couldn't put that fence up without a gate at some point for us to access the meter. Mm -hmm. You must violate that constantly in every city. Actually, when we read meters, no. We enforced that pretty heavily because we actually went to every meter. Yeah. So they would they would try to prevent us to lock it, but we would always have to get <coughs> access. They, there's, you know, we would work with the customer, say, hey, we're coming on this day. You're going to have to open that up. So they would generally give us access at that point. Yeah. 
No, I would second. So you're, you're we're we're looking at option two. Option two. That was where yeah, that was option two. We got a motion on option two and a second on option two. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. So opposed was Jamie and then Tim, right? Yes. Got it. Thank you. So what is it? Okay, motion is passed. And Dave, then you're going to talk to him about option two then? Yes. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go to Crook Street then. Uh, the next one is 313 Cook Street. Dave, then you're going to explain to them about the, the fire department for the, the other one for uh, Laura Street? The fire department? Yeah. To, or, or, to the customer I may have to meet with Mark and see what his thoughts are on that. I, I don't know as the ordinance talks about that. I don't know if I can use that as a... I think more of a, an explanation how we came to conclusion two compared to option one. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah. thinking. Explain, we'll to, explain to them explain that's to what the our customer process was. Why, yeah. why yeah. we went with option two versus, yep. versus option one. Yep, I can do that. The, this one here on Cook Street, um, our ordinance says even if they repair the fence, it has to have a permit. They're basically rebuilding it the way it uh, was. Um, so the... Uh, is there another picture on there? Yes, yeah, right there. The, so the pink section that I highlighted there is the section that the Planning Commission has to look at. And that's going to be uh, just a picket fence to replace the one that's deteriorated on their property. So they already have it there. It's, it's already there. It's just, it's kind of in rough shape. So they're going to put all new boards on the picket. Look for a motion to approve the one. Anybody got any questions on Cook Street? Are they going to put a fence all the way around that property? Already Solid there. fence. Yes. It's already there. This is but all it, existing. Uh, oh, this is the big That's yeah. an yeah. Did they get approval for that? Yes. Fence that's yeah, the, along the driveway. Um, That's what I'm wondering what, what that fence is. goes That's behind where ascended. that last that car's parked in the driveway there. So the, the end of the driveway is where the fence is going to come across. And it goes back to the to the garage. Yeah, it runs the perimeter of the property from there yeah, back. And that's the one that I so are they adding this question? Dave, is this going to be added Houston? fence then? Just, I don't know if you can see this or not. The fence is going to be here for the yeah. solid and yep. just the picket out front here. So this is not going to be a fence? No. Okay. No, they drew this up. That, yeah, the highest marks are just the property lines, I think. It's very well, confusing. David, they're changing the fence structure, the, correct? That's the issue? I don't believe so. Just uh, the, the part that we're looking at is just the picket part of the fence. So they're replacing the boards on that. So picket now, and they're going to go right back up with the picket fence. Yep. Just make it up look nicer. Yes. Yeah. I'll make you have motion. to have approval for that by our ordinance. Because it's in the front yard. We yeah, do. Front yard. yeah, because it talks about repairing or replacing or yeah, any. I'll make a motion to approve that picket fence. I'll second it. Motion's been made and seconded to approve the uh, repairing the fence on Cook Street. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm sorry, was that Jay and Susie? Susie. Susie? Hey, Dave Southland. Uh, the next one is 1939 Southland. Looks like Lane. So the owner uh, sent in this drawing. And, uh, the second picture there. I just kind of copied it over to the style that we've, we've kind of been using uh, to keep our files in. 
same thing on this one, just the part there with the, uh, on the other picture where it says front yard is uh, one that the planning commission can look at. The, the, one, the one issue with this is the neighbor. If you can see that dark area there, he's got a solid fence that goes all the way out to his property line. So uh, this guy is gonna install one in the front yard, but it's gonna be a chain link as well. Well, do you have to be three feet away from that guy? Pardon me? Do you have to be three feet away from the other fence? Or a foot? Well, ideally it'd be two. If that guy's a foot off the line, which I don't know if he is or not. Um, his, this fence here that he's proposing has to be a foot off foot the off. property line. Yes. Yeah. Okay. If I'm cutting the grass in between. And I don't know what you see had for this. He didn't really say if it was for kids or animals or just to give himself some. Mm -hmm. Keep the yard tended themselves. I'll bet this wasn't approved either. And that's also any? a chain link fence, I assume. Yes. Anybody got any questions on that one anymore? A promotion to approve the one on 1939 Southland Lane. I'll make a motion to approve. And a motion to approve it. Got a second? I'll second. Motion's made and seconded to approve the fence on Salton Lane. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion's carried. Okay, it looks like we're up to Cedar Corporation. All right, guys, thanks for waiting, but we've got Eric and Ken here from uh, Cedar Corp, and we're in our next step of the city's comprehensive plan. So we're going to hand it over to these guys. Good evening, everyone. I trust that everyone had gotten the materials in your packet. I'm hoping that you had time to review and read them. Um, I don't want to take up too much time going through this, but I did uh, want to say I appreciate it. I believe every planning commissioner actually did the homework and sent it in. Three for a rarity. Uh, so you guys should get some gold stars. So they're um, And also, uh, very pleased with the input uh, uh, on that homework. Uh, I think there were some nice thoughts put into that some good comments and uh, it was very helpful uh, in terms of trying to take a look at the land use chapter and uh, make some modifications to it. So what we're going to look at tonight is draft, obviously is sort of a first cut. We're definitely open to suggestions, <coughs> thoughts, or whether we're hitting the mark on things. Um, I did, wasn't intending on going through the homework uh, to a great degree here unless someone else had some comments or things they wanted to bring up. I know gave you an opportunity to see some commentary from the other plant commissioners, but uh, I thought most of it was self-explanatory. There's a couple of items in there that I did highlight in the document that we can discuss at length a little more, but uh, any comments, questions, surprises with regards to the, the homework assignments? Okay. You can always go back to that. But again, I thought it was very helpful. With regards to the land use chapter, the document itself, uh, pretty much we've gone through this with a fine tooth comb, trying to keep in mind all the comments and the input that were provided, not only at the meeting uh, during our discussion, but again, the homework assignments as well. Um, tried to come up with a system that allowed you to visually see and understand what was being changed in there uh, as well. So I hope that wasn't uh, confusing at all. Um, I think, uh, you know, maybe to start, on page two with the existing land use. Um, I wanna thank Chad for his time and effort going out into the field with the maps that we provided to, to update the land use. Now he understands the tediousness of some of that, but I think at the same time, you, you mentioned you saw some value because it gives you an opportunity to look at parts of the community a little differently and, and see where there's change and things of that nature. So we do have an updated existing land use map in that document. The table on page two, um, we were able to compare the acreages to the 2004 plan, the same uh, categorizations were used. And I didn't really see anything for discrepancies 
uh, that were major or, or of concern. A lot of times when we do this, you're, you're off on numbers because the classifications are slightly different. The one item I wanted to point out, if you didn't catch it though, the biggest change in terms of acres and land use has really been in multifamily residential. And that I think is fairly reflective of some of the trends that we've been seeing. Now, I don't know when you started getting the bulk of more multifamily in terms of what year it is, 2004 may have been a little early in terms of when a lot of more of those demands had come, but I'm guessing most of it probably happened post-recession, post-2008. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's good to see the city has been accommodating of those needs. And obviously we discussed more at length about some of the needs for housing in the community. And uh, I would suspect, you know, we take a look at this in another 10 years and we're gonna have some some big changes in some of those numbers as well. So Eric, are you seeing that trend? I mean, statewide for, you know, everything's kind of- Not not to this degree though. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I, you know, we see increases. But this is, as Eric pointed out, fairly, fairly impressive. Yeah. 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 When you look at the totals, obviously the acreage of the city has grown simply by annexations, probably not worth digging into detail and comparing every annexation the acreage to make sure it matches up. We'll trust it. Um, but uh, uh, you've got a fair amount of uh, undeveloped or vacant land within the community uh, in terms of hosting new development. So unless you get specific requests uh, for annexation, which is typically the way it's done, I, I don't think you're in need of, of going out to try and find a lot more acreage just to accommodate growth and development in the short term here. We uh, move on to page four. Uh, if you'd like, um, assuming that you've read all of this, uh, I'm just gonna go page by page. I may highlight an item or two, but I, I want you guys to speak up if you saw something or made a note or see something that's not right in here. Uh, bottom part of page two there, we did, basically update a lot of the language in terms of the numbers and the values associated with existing land use and the tables, the bottom there, uh, really attempted to try and, and update the story from the last plan of, of where you've been and, and where you've gone to in terms of where new development has occurred. I'm presuming uh, that hopefully captures things fairly well. Okay. Page five. Projected supply and demands of land uses. Um, we did have to kind of go back and, and it wasn't our intent to update the demographic information of the plan, but we did have to take a look at a few bits and pieces. So we threw that on a couple of pages in the back and we'll format that as an appendix uh, because we need those numbers in terms of calculations. Uh, but uh, as this shows here, um, you know, there's about 3.56 housing units per acre on the residential lands that you have, which is probably a little higher in terms of density. Uh, than most new development that has occurred in many communities. A lot of that has been about a third acre lots or three units per acre. We're bringing in a lot of existing development in older neighborhoods, which is denser, which probably accounts for that uh, increase of three units per acre there. Um, and then in terms of demands and projections, if everything stayed the same and was consistent over time, which we know never happens, um, you know, you're looking at about a need for about 10, eight to 10 acres per year to accommodate development. Um, and that again, is still a bit dependent on the market itself. So we have those projections illustrated on the next page in the table 8.2. Um, I think the thing I wanted to point out with this table again, uh, is, is basically understand that when you have increases in the developed land uses, you're gonna essentially have corresponding decreases in the bottom part of the table with vacant and undeveloped acreage. Uh, but really from our standpoint, no surprises here. Um, you know, you are going to have a peak in terms of growth, the way the projections are stated and whether that happens or not, whether you do start to have the trend of decreasing population, which we have in many rural communities are a little bit larger. Um, so I think you should temper, you know, that thought that at some point we're going to decline. A lot of different things can happen with the market, um, other changes out there with demographics and the way you market the community as well. It could be, you know, changes could happen based on an industry coming into town or an industry closing in town. So again, we don't worry too much about this, but we wanted to kind of give a ballpark about what you can expect. I think it's, the point is it should be manageable. 
you shouldn't have tons and tons of development coming where you're overwhelmed and getting concerned about the pace of development <clears throat> like some communities uh, can get. The next page seven, um, some of these things need to be filled in later because we haven't uh, made any decisions on what that preferred or that future land use map looks like. Once we do, we can calculate acreages and we can go back and do some comparisons here. So that stuff is to be determined. Page eight, um, one suggestion I'm making, and, and we can change this back if you like, but uh, I noticed you use the term preferred land use. Um, many communities, and, and I guess us as practitioners, just naturally say future land use, future land use. So we made the changes there. If you want it to be preferred land use, we can do that, but I did want to point that out. Um, not much else on that page to really point out in terms of highlights. And then page nine, again, we'll be taking a look at that future land use map and we'll be uh, updating some of the info based on that. Just as a reminder, Chad, I believe we had asked, um, we need to try and obtain the digital data, the GIS data of the preferred land use map that's in the plan currently. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if you have any contacts at Folk who did that or can dig around to see if that's information you have on hand. So they didn't send that in the last packet that they sent us then? We didn't, you know, we didn't get anything. Um, just know if that isn't available for some reason, then we need to kind of recraft the entire map, which adds a lot of additional work. We can talk about that mm -hmm. later. So yep. let us know if you're having problems or issues with that and we'll do what we can to help. Um, page 10, and a few tables that will be added once we have the future land use figured out uh, there. But I think the meat of a lot of our discussion happens after this as we get into land use classifications on page 11. Uh, we talked. Uh, a fair amount at the last meeting about the different classifications and the way the maps used and some of these categories along with uh, issues pertaining to density, housing styles, commercial styles, those types of things. So uh, we made a number of edits and suggested changes uh, to this. Um, one was uh, getting rid of the term conservation district and calling it an agricultural transition um, or just agricultural transition. And then a number of changes regarding uh, uh, the description of that, um, probably nothing alarming there. Uh, we did make sure we added indoor storage facilities to the discouraged uses. Um, that has become more of an issue in many communities. You see the storage units popping up all over the place. It's amazing how much junk people have apparently to store. Um, of course, my garage is getting pretty full too. So um, I did make a note under the resource protection in green there. Uh, it mentioned that at the time that the, these maps were developed, that there wasn't any floodplain uh, data that could be used in crafting that map. And I'm not sure why, but it does appear that data is now available. And I would presume that the Planning Commission would like to have that incorporated in terms of areas that, for the most part, are not developable. Um, there may be some instances, we'll have to see how that lays over the existing land use. But in general, I'm guessing you you shun development in the floodplain, so you'd want that to continue on and be captured and kind of conceptually illustrated here. Okay. Very good. Next page, uh, single family development or what was known as single family development. As we start working with communities and looking at the needs of them in terms of the housing styles, the affordability, uh, duplexes are still often an option. There's many communities out there that really don't discern the difference at this level of planning of a, of a single family versus a duplex. Sometimes they're even about the same size and sometimes you can't even tell depending on the design. So what we'd like to propose, at least in terms of the comprehensive plan, not necessarily reflecting all the time in your zoning ordinance, but really combining and, and adding duplex to that categorization where you're not affecting the density of an area a great deal in that sense. It may eliminate some, some issues or problems that you might come across in the future, ones that you've had in the past by just keeping it kind of generalized at this level. 
So that's one thing that, that we would suggest. We also talked a little bit about accessory dwelling units or ADUs as a possible option for affordable housing. The ability for some of the existing residents is the single family ones to have uh, an accessory dwelling unit either attached could be in the basement, could be on an upper floor or detached. It could be a garage conversion. It could be a small uh, cottage basically that's built in the back of the uh, uh, existing uh, lot. Um, there's a lot of details that need to be considered in terms of allowing and regulating them, but many communities are now incorporating this into their zoning ordinance. So uh, we figured at least to get the conversation going, we should probably include that um, you know in the comp plan and acknowledge that those are units that, that could be considered ultimately but of course you're going to end up deferring to zoning regulations and other restrictions and details that you don't need to get into at this level so i wanted to and we put an illustration there but i wanted to make sure uh, you know we, we've got some feedback on that is the way this laid out and structured and stated is this something you're comfortable with um, do you have some hesitation in any way? Does this help clarify things? When you put this into the single family and duplex, you know, categorization, I mean, you're not really defining areas on the future land use map specifically for something like this. It's just, a lot, it would be allowed in any R1, R2 single family. Those are really decisions that need details that need to be decided with respect to the zoning ordinances and, and what's allowed and what's regulated. You know, what this is saying is conceptually that, yes, we think that's a good idea. And in most circumstances, it could probably work. But again, the devil's in the details and, and need to flesh that out within the zoning ordinance. Yeah, I mean, the plan is to give you your zoning ordinance is going to be designed so that if you're going to do a rezone, it has to be consistent with your plan. So the, the thought here is try to, in your plan, give a little bit more flexibility in those definitions. Okay, now you get to the code. If you're looking at situations of the single family du duplex designation and your future land use map, but you're still a little nervous about the duplex situation, you wanna put that maybe under a conditional use, you can certainly do that, okay? That, but that gets defined more in the code. But what Eric's talking about in trying to, uh, create a little bigger net for that classification of your future land use map would include single family, duplex and ADUs, okay? How comfortable you are with them, you can get into the details in your code if you wanna put those as a conditional use and have a little bit more discussion about that. But you know, the ADUs are being driven primarily by the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of people are aging, the cost of, of uh, Housing for elderly is going up. So a lot of people are saying, well, why, you know, if you could give me some liberties that to live independently but yet within some security of a family unit, that would be one reason that's driving it so that people can live longer in a single family type structure, which I think most of us, if we were healthy and aging, would want to do, right? That's probably what we prefer to do. So this kind of opens the door for that. The other trend that we've been seeing is you know, it's been tougher to get the younger folks out of the house <laughs> because, you know, it's just costly to get, for them to live out there, especially in the housing side. So this creates a little bit of a bridge for them to be able to do that within a single family structure. So those are the two primary drivers and two trends that I don't see going away anytime soon. So. Um, I think we've already had a couple of those where we, you know, the one north of, or east of town where a family built for the mother whose home burned down and they wanted to just add building for her. So it's happening. Those are here last year. Yeah. 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 Um, another question on the duplex. Um, is there any differentiation that we, we need to kind of talk about here, like a duplex condo situation compared to the traditional duplex? Condo is really a form of ownership, not necessarily a land use distinction. And so there are there are intricacies that need to be dealt with regarding that. But from this perspective, this type of plan, the ownership really is immaterial or the model that's used for ownership. Cool. 
not that that shouldn't be considered or come into play when you're looking at those <clears throat> situations, you know, compared to the regulations, but it's a good question. What about um, covenants uh, for certain developments? I know I built a duplex and I had to uh, get signatures from the neighbors, you know, as far as to, to allow me to build the duplex in that development. So those were covenants that were part of the subdivision and right. applied to that lot. Um, Does that, that need really, to be addressed in here or not? No, not necessarily. I, I think, you know, covenants are, are nothing new uh, nowadays. It'll be interesting to see if there's changes to those because covenants often can obviously limit activities or add expense sometimes, depending on what the covenants address. That's really a matter between uh, the developer and the okay. folks buying the properties or a homeowners association. And things can get sticky, mm -hmm. uh, obviously. Um, I've seen subdivisions go in that have covenants where you kind of think, well, why should they even bother putting covenants in? You know, if the, the stuff next door that might be 10 years older than that never did what are they afraid of but the development community seems to think that the covenants protect them allow them to get higher value for their property or, or give some kind of assurance to the people buying the lots and while it may how many problems do you have in places that don't have covenants you know a lot of the covenants address a lot of visual things too like uh, you know rvs parked in driveway Basketball hoops, uh, storage mailboxes, units, and, garbage cans, you know, things like units. that that people get nervous about that it's going to devalue the property. So that's kind of a package a developer puts together to assure their <coughs> buyers and those in the neighborhood that are getting afforded some protections outside of, of what ordinances the municipality would have. So um, in your situation, if you are in a, are in a development with covenants, then they, you know, depend on how aggressive the homeowner, homeowners association is in implementing those and making sure that they're carried out. Not a city matter. Okay. Uh, bottom part of that, and uh, I realized after reviewing the document after assent that I wanted to make a change here. Um, uh, the multifamily residential district, I'd actually like to propose we get rid of the term multifamily and replace that with high density, uh, medium to high density, or term similar to that. The term multifamily just has a bit of a stigma associated with it. Always kind of leans towards oh, apartments, those people, which we all know isn't always necessarily true. Uh, and I think removing that term from this plan document helps remove some of that stigma and gets people to understand that that higher density development can come in a number of forms. And that's what we attempted to do here was list uh, things. Yes, you could have some standard apartment type buildings, a fourplex, uh, eightplex, uh, et cetera. But I think under this broad land use category, you should also be considering other styles that are more dense than a typical single family or duplex type of use. And, and that could be uh, townhouses attached, detached, uh, things called bungalow courts or cottage style developments and garden apartments. Um, we're starting to see more of those kinds of uses where you're really talking about a, a set of small homes. Um, they could range anywhere from 700 to 1200 square feet, but they're typically arranged in a manner um, uh, that, that gives enough space, enough independence to the homeowners, but also to some degree forms a community of just that development. Um, they can be integrated into existing areas of development. I know City of Oshkosh, I think, is approving a couple uh, that are on their uh, plate, or they could happen in a green field if you desire. Um, but I think changing things to be more talking about medium to high density development instead of apartments is gonna kind of broaden the scope, give you the flexibility or development community flexibility when it comes to trying to look at consistency with what the plan says versus what your ordinances say. Do you see in municipalities change their ordinance to reflect the same language as in high density instead of having multifamily in their zoning? I haven't seen a lot of that yet. Ken, can you speak to that? No, but it's probably a change that will be coming. You know, a little bit more of a change in the industry. I think what Eric's talking about with smaller uh, independent structures, individual structures, but in fact, closer can take out the high density. Okay, that's a different look than 
a big building with a bunch of apartments inside of it, which is what this definition kind of leads to. Now, how we address it, we'd have to codify that. We have to look at the roads and make sure that I know Door County is going through through some, some significant changes they're entertaining right now and their zoning ordinance to try to accommodate those types of housing needs for their seasonal workforce up there. So um, you know, we may have to um, you know, start shadowing some of those code changes to be able to accommodate those types of densities here. And the following page and, and everything we just talked about really is, is what's been now defined and called the missing middle. Um, you know, we've got a lot of single family and duplex kind of uses and, and, and in bigger cities, at least, you know, you got big towering kind of apartment buildings, um, but it's everything in the middle that would be missing for many communities. Now, New London is probably not likely to get things on the higher end of that spectrum uh, in terms of that scale. But certainly, you know, from from medium multiplex or townhouse on down, um, we see some opportunities there in terms of the general style of buildings that could be allowed under that uh, medium to high density broad classification. Whether some of those things need to be addressed in the zoning ordinance ultimately and, and more regulation, but again, we're we're at kind of a conceptual level here. This will give you a good scale to having some kind of metric in here, some sort of visual. When you're meeting with developers and people have ideas, this is a good graphic to kind of at least put on a table initially and say, okay, you know, what are you looking at providing here? Here, because here's we we are looking at a whole range of options of how we can accommodate this missing middle piece to be a little bit more on track of what the affordability uh, range is for for the new buyers coming into our city. So this gives you a little bit of a gauge for which that developer can react to and, and, and tell you that they're thinking more of the townhouse or the courtyard type situation. And that would help the fall through the discussions of what you want in that neighborhood or in that area. It's a good graphic to have as a starting point. Any questions, concerns on that? Move on to page 14, um, planned commercial. Um, we didn't make a lot of changes there, but one thing we did talk about was maybe have expanding some flexibility within those areas to, to at least consider, possibly allow some mixed uses in terms of incorporating residences above first floor retail. Um, many times those things are gonna happen more in a downtown environment like this. And we have that address or already has in your community downtown commercial, but in the planned commercial district, we are starting to see places like you have as you go north out of town where it's been traditional kind of highway regional commercial um, that, that those places don't last forever and maybe in need of redevelopment over time. And this, being worded this way can give you the opportunity to start asking that question when new uses come in or transitions take place of, do we want to change the character of that area? Are we seeing demands? Do we have an opportunity to add some residential units to some of those areas? Um, the good thing is many times they're already close to a variety of, of retail and other services. You know, they're walkable. Uh, if you start adding some residential uses and if people don't mind, you know, some of that, but, you know, the market would dictate that. I don't think a lot of those changes would happen or be proposed uh, very quickly, but over time, as some of those businesses start aging out or the markets change, this could give you the ability to at least consider that. You'd have to, again, look at the details from a zoning regulation perspective. Um, but we thought we might want to throw that in that district just to give you a little more flexibility. Something you'll be comfortable with, at least conceptually. Uh, no other major changes there, page 15. Um, we did specifically make sure we, we put the uh, religious worship establishments in as discouraged uses, we had some conversations about that. Um, allow indoor storage, but not outdoor storage. And uh, we're talking about the plant industrial areas. So only needed a few minor tweaks, I think, to that section to kind of meet the, the expectations of the conversation that we had last time. 
page 16, uh, quite a number of changes here. Um, but I think first and foremost, uh, uh, the existing map that you're working with had these primary growth areas and the secondary growth, secondary growth areas. So you had, you had solid colors and you had all of these hatched lines indicating secondary growth areas. Um, I don't, I don't think we need to complicate it that much. I think it's sort of assume that if it's a solid color, um, that, that it's something that you do have planned as a primary growth area. Um, we can keep the secondary growth area term for these hatched areas, that's not problematic. Um, but uh, like I said, if it's already designated as a 20 year growth area, that's your primary growth area. So anything we can do to simplify the map, simplify the terminology and not confuse those that have to administer the plan or interpret it on your end, I think would be good. A um, few little tweaks to, uh, again, some of the uh, definitions there. Um, it allows us to eliminate uh, the industrial expansion area and some of the other terminology uh, simply by, by simplifying it in that manner. And it really shouldn't have an impact on how you normally use the plan or do business. That makes sense. Questions or concerns about that? Okay. Page 17, again, this is where a lot of the uh, discussion that we had in commentary was very helpful um, in terms of making some changes to the statements that already uh, existed for existing land use conflicts and potential land use conflicts. These will change over time. And we recognize that since your plan work was done, there are other things that have crept up in terms of trending land uses. So we wanted to capture those things here. Um, so I'm hoping we captured everything. Was there anything missing or of concern or question on what was listed? What do you mean by intensive agricultural practices? Ooh, say mega farms okay. might be one. Um, that certainly could be of concern. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, traditional agriculture, growing corn or hay or wheat or anything like that shouldn't be an issue. So I think people know what to expect, but if you do have something that comes in um, or next door, you know, outside the city, it might be something that you want to comment on or get involved with if it's going to start affecting your landowners, not just town residents. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're on next page, page 18. <clears throat> Again, we took a look at the land use goals and objectives. Um, there was a comment made under goal one that I just kind of wanted to explore a little bit. Someone had mentioned that, that we need to decide on your future needs before setting goals. I really wouldn't argue with that. But we're kind of working with an existing plan and existing statements. Um, we haven't gone through a full comprehensive plan update process to really get into the, to the weeds on what all of the needs are out there. We did talk a little bit at length about housing primarily, a bit about commercial and industrial. Um, so I just wanna make sure that that comment doesn't need more discussion by the plan commission. I, I don't know who wrote it down even, but uh, if that person wants to volunteer, explain that more, or if, if there's some issues with how, how this is pulled together without talking more about needs. Try and find a way to deal with that. Off the cuff question, comment, I'm guessing then. So, and that's fine, but we wanted to double check. Um, but a number of changes made to the objectives, um, not necessarily the goal statements. We felt for the most part, those were in pretty good shape. Uh, but the objectives, this is where we tried to incorporate some of the very specific comments that we heard um, during the meeting or in the feedback, as well as uh, with some of our uh, professional experience. Um, but I think it, it tightens these up a little bit, clarifies things a little more, makes them more uh, timely um, and, and less dated in that sense. Um, but certainly interested to hear any comments or thoughts, concerns, objections to those modifications. It's a lot to digest, I know, but. Hearing nothing, 
um, page 19, and a few minor changes uh, made to some of the language there. I think maybe most importantly, uh, LU5 at the bottom, uh, wanted to make sure that we at least acknowledge or included the statement that, that home-based businesses uh, might fall under that policy or city position. Um, we do know because of the pandemic that there's been changes in the workforce and the workplace. Some people now are working permanently at home, um, but I think there's gonna be more opportunities, more entrepreneurship and other things happening that you may start getting more requests for actual home-based businesses. And that's different than working from home because if you have a home-based business, it's assumed that you've got customers, you've got traffic, you've got cars, you've got parking, you've got other things going on which can affect the neighbors. If you're just working from home like I do two days a week, my neighbors don't even know other than my car's in the driveway. So I want to make sure we discern that and added it to that uh, land use policy statement. Questions on that, page 20. Actually go back to, um, I wrote down beforehand the LU3. Yes. Um, city shall require the area development plans I don't think that's something that we, is that a specific plan that developers should be giving us? A lot of times it has to do with the scale of what's being proposed. Um, in many communities, development happens at small scales. It's a 10 acre piece of land. It's a 20 acre piece of land. And maybe in some communities up to 40, which typically isn't too much of a concern. But sometimes uh, someone will acquire, assemble multiple pieces of land, you know, hey, I. I got 120 acres here. And eventually, you know, through conversation, you find out that they want to develop the entire thing over time, whether that happens in five years or 50 years, who knows. But when you run into those situations, you'd rather not deal with things piecemeal, 20 acres at a time. We know this guy wants to develop the whole 120. So you're basically either requiring or requesting that you have a, at least a sketch plan for the entirety of the property and maybe even some of the properties adjacent to it, even though they don't own it, you can still kind of plan and sketch things out, but you're interested in making sure you've got good street connections for the most part, getting an understanding of lot sizes and land uses. You know, we're gonna do single family over here, but we intend on doing multifamily over there. If they're just submitting a 20 acre piece and it's all single family, you don't know what's gonna be next door. But if they're in control of it, then you really want to do that at that scale. Um, you as a community could do some area development plans, even though you don't own any of the property. Um, you know, I think maybe south of town is, is uh, a good example where you've got some extensive lands marked as secondary uh, growth area south of Becker Avenue and west of County D. Uh, if you as the community feel that that's an area that's going to you know, happen and development's going to happen or be kind of a hot spot. you may want to go in there and say, we want to take a look at that whole area. Yeah, we colored it yellow for residential, but we want to add another level of detail to that. You want to go in there and start kind of playing around sketching out road patterns and maybe dividing land up that, you know, this part over here would make a nice park. Um, over here, better for high density development, low density, some commercial, and really start playing around with those ideas. And you could formalize that plan, adopting it, making it part of the comprehensive plan. It's still a guide at that point, um, but it would give those landowners or future landowners because land can change ownership, a little better feel for what the city's looking for or, or would like to have when something is formally submitted. Um, Ken and I have been working in the town of Clayton, west of the Fox Cities um, at the interchange uh, Highway 10 and 76. Um, the entire area to the north and the south 3,000 acres, I think. We basically prepared an area development plan, multiple, multiple landowners, um, but getting the big picture look of that's the target development area for that community. Let's flesh it out a little more than having two or three broad categories of residential commercial. So there's more detail. We worked out road patterns. We figured out with the help of others uh, where regional stormwater ponds were going to go uh, basically the, the framework for development still leaves a lot of flexibility for the individual landowner or developer, but it gives them a little bit more of a box that they're in and they understand the expectations more. 
what the community is looking for. And some of the thoroughfares, you know, some some of the future roads are kind of no brainers. You know, you know that that's going to have to be a collector street going, you know, through this particular area. So the next step would be to put that on your official map and make sure that you know there's no development that could occur then on that regional detention stormwater, which they want to cost-effective reasons to look at it that way. So looking at a bigger area, working with the engineer to be able to say, okay, this area we're going to reserve for stormwater, a regional stormwater pond, instead of making all these individual property owners do their own thing on site, uh, helps a lot. And I guess what, what Eric's saying, it's not a lot of, you know, it's just human nature that when you propose something, you've got 20 acres you want to develop it, they put all your energy just on your 20 acres. Okay, and you're not really looking too much around you. And what people do certainly impacts their neighbors. So area development planning just kind of make sure that if there's a an action, there's an equal and positive reaction as to what that could bring in terms of more traffic, how pedestrians are going to move through the area, how traffic is going to move through the area, how stormwater is going to be managed, whether or not parks need to be reserved, and a whole host of other things that that development could impact or open up an area for development. Uh, page 20, again, a uh, number of little changes there, but I don't think anything uh, shocking. Uh, we made sure some of the language in LU7 was kind of updated and consistent with the comprehensive plan statutes and just clarified some of that. Um, LU11 kind of called out, at least at this level, home-based businesses might be something you want to do as a conditional use in a zoning district, uh, deal with some of the impacts of those kinds of things. So uh, again, I think just clarification, it didn't really change a lot of the intent of the statements there. Eric, page, oh, in LU10, uh, Wisconsin Act 67, I'm not familiar with that one. What's just in a nutshell? I'm trying to remember what this. That's an X67. Yeah. What's that one? Oh, uh, that's, that's a condition to the conditional uh, use. Yeah. That, that says that there's specific requirements uh, in terms of you must, before you wish a conditional use permit, you must base your decision on substantial evidence. With Those things are measurable, okay? So that the applicant as well as the city knows what they're being held to in the review of that conditional use, okay? There's some other procedures that are outlined, but that's pretty much the crux of it. Okay, and the law was formed and passed because sometimes conditions were placed on developments that were just arbitrary. There was no way to really uh, determine if they were going to be met or not met, you know? Uh, and they had to be based on something substantial, something documented. And it really, what it did was elevated the conditional use permit to the point where it's almost agreement between the applicant and the municipality. These are the conditions by which the planning commission has approved your conditional use. These are the metrics of how you're going to be measured. Uh, and then both parties, I think it was a great law as I get through the administration parts of things. It was a great law because it really clarified what the expectations were on both ends. And it brings out that conversation. So uh, you don't want to be arbitrary in your issuance of conditional uses. Now there's a law that says, well, you really need to be very specific if, on the evidence that you're measuring. If you had a conditional use for, for some kind of use, commercial, but it's next to residential, and you kind of said, well, you know, we can see that, but we want a buffer between that and the residential. You know, if you had a, a treat buffer there, it'd be good. And if you approve that as conditional use, how do you measure that? A tree buffer. Well, you might want to say, we expect to see at least 12 trees along there, apply some numbers or some specifics to it so that you can enforce or go back uh, if necessary. So there's no confusion on what was going to be required. Hours of operation, very specific, yeah. whatever those may be. Lighting, very specific, can't have any glare, can't uh, splash, be any light splash outside the property. If it, if it can be, you'd have a, a metric as to what that would be acceptable as. Materials for the building, pitches of roofs, uh, those types of things specific as to what those would be. That, group, that law came up, if, if you want to know the history, the law came out of the frack mine sandy, uh, the frack sand mining uh, issues that developed in the western part of the state 
where towns and counties were slapping these arbitrary conditions on these mining operations. And they finally got to the point where the mining, uh, the mining folks went to the legislator and said, you know, you've got to protect. And you see that with cell towers, you see that with solar farms, and you see that with a lot of big utilities and industries that they were going to scream to the legislators to make sure that they're going to put conditions on us. Uh, it has to be, we have to know what those conditions are. And it's just kind of parlayed now into the regular conditional use process. It's always been a good standard practice, but some places it was just never done. Or it helps. Uh, last page 21 there, uh, LU12, uh, again, a point that was made in one of the comments in the homework, I want to make sure we're not glossing over it or we discuss it, but someone did comment that, uh, you know, uh, design standards and those things, you know, might overcomplicate things and might deter business from coming. Uh, again, I don't know who uh, wrote that. Um, and uh, and I'd say, you know, there, there's some, you know, merit to that a little bit that it, it may deter some businesses, but I think for the most part, businesses, developers understand that there may be some of these kinds of conditions and these needs and these design standards. It's there to protect the community, the neighbors, uh, and making sure that you get what you want and looking how you want it. Um, you don't necessarily want McDonald's across the street in your downtown environment unless it looks like something that should belong there. McDonald's actually has done that in many communities, you know, old communities in, in the Northeast, you know, that have buildings from the 1700s. They've managed to fit design standards and still operate a McDonald's in there. So design standards are fairly typical in many communities. If you don't have some, it's something that I think you might want to take a look at, particularly for some specific areas, whether it's the downtown, whether it's some of the commercial corridors, um, design standards can apply to industrial uh, areas as well, and we've seen that. Um, typically, they're not going to go so far as to deal with the single family residential or a lot of residential uses, um, but uh, certainly commercial, uh, it, it's almost an expectation, I would say, of the development community. So, yes, it might add some costs too, but in fact, I did a project in the village of Kimberly once. Um, Walgreens wanted to come into the community there. They've got a little triangular piece of land and uh, the community didn't really want it and thought one way perhaps to discourage them is to develop design standards and that they're gonna have to go through all these extra hoops. Well, the community did that with my help and they adopted them and Walgreens took a look at it and said, yeah, okay, we'll spend the extra money. We still wanna be there. Well, they found other reasons to say no to it and it ended up going across the river in Little Shoot, but, you know, some businesses expect it and they'll, they'll pay what it takes to, to meet those standards. So, well, sounds like nothing else we need to change on that, but again, just wanted to point that out. Um, a few other minor changes on there, but I think that's, that's the gist of it. You know, going through this, trying to make those tweaks, I, I think was certainly more helpful having the conversation that we did the input that we had from the homework there. And, and probably the next version that you see here, we'll end up having some of those red text areas, the tables filled in once we get through the land use mapping part and we'll clean it up so you can kind of see what it looks like with all, without all those editing marks um, and still an opportunity to have some discussion or make some changes. Um, but keep that in front of you. If there's some things that, that weren't addressed in here in particular, if you think something's missing, um, that'll be the most important to make sure that we have those things incorporated. You know, we can work some stuff all day, but we want to want to wrap things up as well. So, um, other thing we want to discuss tonight and share uh, is at least some broad concepts regarding future land use. And I wanted to make sure that you also had the existing land use map in front of you. For comparison. And then again, based partly on the input and the comments that were made, looking at your current plan, um, taking a bit of a drive around the community to reach the other end by itself. I don't know if you want to share well, but there's parts I can remember. Um, 
start sketching some things up. And that's exactly what this is, a sketch. Nothing set in stone here, but we wanted to try and get some initial feedback. Uh, so basically on top of the map that they already have, uh, we started looking at specific areas of the community that we might want to start changing some things on the map and obviously trying to have it match the categories, the naming conventions that we have in the document for classifications uh, will be key, but don't worry too much about that. Um, I think first and foremost, you know, it was interesting looking at the map that you have here because not all of it, but in certain places, it almost resembles a zoning map where you're, you're not dealing with broad general land uses that you've got little specific things called out. Usually not an issue with institutional uses, parks, things like that. But, you know, we've got a little multifamily there, some higher density, um, and, and you separate that out. I'm not sure it's terribly important. And if anything, it can lock you in uh, to, to uh, omitting change from happening on some of those properties if you specifically call it out like that. So broadly, we may wanna take a look at that and, and generalize and get rid of some of those little things so it doesn't look like a zoning map. Your zoning map will serve that purpose. Um, but kind of taking a walk around the community here, um, south uh, east quadrant here, sort of uh, the entrance and one of the gateways here, um, there's just generally a bit of a hodgepodge of land uses in that area that we noticed and, and a fair amount is industrial. I think kind of cleaning this up in terms of the categorization, you know, areas that are industrial, existing industrial and things that will infill, uh, let's just, just make it all one category, um, an area that allows for commercial, perhaps mixed use development along the main part of that corridor. Over time, there may be some redevelopment of that. Um, I think that's one area that we could kind of clean up a little bit and simplify for the most part. And again, if anything, it's gonna give you more flexibility in terms of what you're dealing with for any land use change in that area. The southern part, south of Becker Road, uh, this whole strip here certainly, um, I think has some opportunities if and when it's available uh, or on the market or, or things could happen. Um, but I think instead of just generalizing that it would be residential land use, I think this is where we can start integrating the concept of basically creating neighborhoods. Um, if you deal with things at a certain scale of, of you know, 40 to 100, 200 acres, in some instances, um, you really want to take a look at that uh, uh, in terms of creating a neighborhood, making it more walkable, incorporating a mix of different types of uses, some lower density single family duplex uses, perhaps some uh, higher density uses, maybe a little bit of commercial or mixed use fronting Becker Road, conceptually a park or some green space in there. Um, we don't have to lay it out exactly like this, but what we wanted to illustrate was in that area, as well as several others, that, that that could be a growth area and you shouldn't make it a monotonous single use type of situation. You've got opportunities to create community, uh, to create interactions between land use and mixes of land use, and maybe even open the door up for more affordable housing in some of those situations instead of kind of cookie cutter, single family residential, and then dealing with not in my backyard issues because that that higher density stuff doesn't match what I have. So ingraining at this level, that mixture of land uses. Uh, same thing on the west side here. Uh, you've got some areas uh, that, that uh, to some degree, uh, you know, th those roads kind of terminate in dead end is sort of the end of the community. Um, but I think that could be a specialness of those areas. Uh, and again, allow for some different types of uses that might be traditional, um, uh, a couple of those areas I thought might be good for those cottage style developments um, because they're a bit secluded, maybe a little more private and, and could add some uh, interest to that. The downtown area, we talked about that at length and, and we can play with the lines a little bit, potentially kind of fuzzy here, but really trying to condense and simplify uh, the land use categorization for the general downtown and some areas beyond that uh, to allow for basically uh, mixed use commercial development, the expectation that we would definitely consider proposals that incorporate residential uses within that general area. Um, and again, we're, we're keeping this at the 30,000 foot level. Um, 
the to the north. I always keep forgetting street names. It's Sh the Shano Street, right? Shano, yeah. yeah. Never sits right in my brain that I'm in New London. You call it Shano Street. So, uh, but as as you go up Shano, um, that's definitely been the bulk of your your retail regional kinds of use as highway commercial a little bit in that sense, easily accessible from 45 and 54. Uh, there's quite a bit of land out there, and and you know looking at a map versus driving and kind of looking at the expanse. Having it just all generalized as, as commercial, um, that's pretty pie in the sky. You know, how much commercial can that area handle and absorb and will it continue to grow? We think some of those changes and the trends happening, uh, you're not going to see a lot more of that, certainly not to fill that entire space. So we think, again, looking at those areas perhaps as a mix, integrating residential, some of the medium, higher density residential, allowing some additional commercial, perhaps changing the nature of what that looks like in terms of mixed use. Maybe there's some opportunities for retail and first floor apartments above or a couple of stories or offices uh, would be appropriate. Um, you know, again, looking at the amount of land that's going to be demanded for land use change compared to what's on the ground. Even what we have shown there is probably well beyond 20 years worth of, of land and development. But uh, thinking ahead, uh, this is where I think you could start transitioning some of the, the very separated land use into making uh, mixed use communities. Um, really not unlike what you, you have down here. The ex exception is that all the residential stuff is behind the commercial. So trying to integrate that a bit more. Um, I did want to clarify and make sure we're right here too, because I, I didn't know this, but this whole vacant area here is noted as the New London nature area that is a public property. Is that school district? Nope. It's city. That's city. It was stewardship funded. Okay. Um, okay. It's it a city property. It's designated for future parkland. Okay. Okay. It's a farm field now, but it's right. I think the old map shows it as residential. So that must have been a, a change since that map was done. Yeah, that should be, uh, okay. well, that's preferred, but- uh, Yep, yep. well, the, yeah, we're looking, both are preferred. Yep. So the, the current preferred land use showed it as residential, but in reality, oh. a big chunk of that ought to be recreation. Correct. Okay. Yep. So that might be more of a correction. Is, was that, I'm really curious as to the, the, the driver there for that, because you look out there and you say, okay, there's a fairly, significant piece of fairly flat developable property was that put there to try to integrate some green space in that neighborhood or, or separation between what could be to the west uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious as to the history of, of how that green space came to be and what its purpose was i'm not aware of the reasoning but i do know that it was purchased by the city through stewardship funding so since it's tied to dnr stewardship it has to be well it's got to stay there yeah. stay in the public realm for public recreation so i can't i don't know if it was an opportunity and they just was that you can build this golf course there i have no clue yeah wasn't that good was that I guy was the city administrator of that? the land that it, yeah, I thought he was going to put it. They wanted to put a nine hole golf course there. Yeah, and that's I don't know who the city administrator was then, but that's been well, Jim Municipal, Pat municipal huh? of course. Yeah, right Jim yeah. Patrick. Patrick. Yeah, yeah. Patrick. Well, it's, this would not preclude well, that from happening in terms of this type of plan. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but interesting idea. Yeah. Do you stewardship your funds to buy it? Wow, that's pretty swampy. When so you get it's out of that, be there. available for public use. Then they could charge. Yeah, but okay. Well, I guess for the purpose of this plan, we kind of have to look at it as, as a recreational area mm -hmm. and potentially maybe a green space, space area in which development could you know occur around it. I guess. Well, and with all the development, the housing that's going out that direction. We really should have something for kids and yes, you know. Yeah. Out that was there. brought up. Yeah. You know what you have there, there is now you've got <laughs> quite a bit of multifamily housing, and the area is kind of laid out. Um, 
as kind of a, a highway business. There's not much association, walkability, connection between the residential and the commercial mm -hmm. uses. And I think that's what Eric and I are saying when you get just north of there now on that clean piece is to try to uh, design that a little bit more uh, without uh, so much presence of the, the automobile stamp, a little bit more of the interaction between commercial and, and residential. And you, you've got a fairly, fairly decent population base to work with there now with the existing multifamily that's there. So uh, if we've got a park there now, we could certainly look at trying to integrate something around that. Well, and that Bowman significant change from your your past future. That Bowman subdivision filled up with single family homes with that you know there are kids and yeah. Yep. Well, the size of that property too, it could serve as a <clears throat> sub regional you know park. So if there is additional development uh, uh, across uh, Street um, to the north uh, in, in those new neighborhoods. Um, that would certainly serve a purpose. You need to be concerned about safety and traffic and crossing uh, the road there, obviously. Uh, but adding to the trails and connectivity, um, as we have broadly indicated here, uh, might be uh, of, of interest. There's a couple of places where you just put some parents staff lines saying, you know, we, we need to find ways to connect that more from a pedestrian standpoint. And then there is some of the old railroad right away going to the north. Which I think you know could be a nice addition um, as a potential trail um, and getting that connected to the rest of the system here. Again, that might be pie in the sky. That may never happen. But if you don't have a vision and don't put it on a map, it's certainly not going to happen. So, uh, but again, this is very broad level. Just kind of some of the initial thoughts and and interested in your feedback. Is this? kind of going the direction that you felt things should go based on our conversation, based on what we we're looking at in terms of edits in the document and talking about all those different things. I was gonna add some of my input as far as the general manager of the utilities. Do we have enough um, scope down the road for future industrial? I mean, the area that I see designated is kind of already designated, but shouldn't we allow for growth? You know, we have a lot of growth for residential yeah. customers and where I see our electric availability would be on Becker Road. I mean, we already have an established loop there. We service some very large customers. Yeah. So we would have availability, you know, on Becker Road. Obviously, we don't know what's coming, but do we have enough allocated for that industry? Because that's where we want to grow as a city. I mean, we want to bring more industry. That's going right. to bring more people to the community and more jobs. You've certainly got the newer industrial park up in the northeast uh, there, and, and there seems to be you know plenty of land that you've got a handful <laughs> right. of businesses. Actually, I was quite surprised. I never knew that existed there, yeah. and, and yep. but it seems a little disconnected and out of place, but right. it's neither here nor there. Um, and you do have a fair amount of lands around that primary area indicated for expansion of that. Um, I think that and with some infill uh, on the west side of 45 north of County S, um, you're probably going to have enough land to accommodate those needs. But a lot of times it's location, 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 whether it's based on utilities or based on uh, the type of business. So I don't think there'd be any problem or concern as we take a look at that land to the south of Becker Road, of uh, possibly adding some additional industrial land to that. Maybe it's uh, simply uh, the, the frontage, some of the frontage along County D. Um, maybe it's taking up more of that orange area. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got that there's a tower there, I think, too. Um, but but perhaps that can serve as a little more of a buffer before you have uh, residential and other types of development. So um, no, I appreciate that observation. Yeah. And and if you like, we can we can look at that area more. We can play around with that of adding some. I mean, obviously, industrial. that north industrial park is where we would like to put. You know, I mean, that's closest to our substation. Right. So that's going to be easiest for us to develop that for a larger customer. Yeah, um, I'm always looking at the scope of, you know, what do we want for industry? Obviously, you want to swing for the fences. I mean, another um, Hillshire or Amcor would be a great addition to our community if we could get more. Yeah, yeah. and there's something to be said, too, with what you're suggesting. Uh, you know, the, the current industrial park is fairly isolated. It's not 
you know, I live over here in the community and I can walk to work. Right. Um, so an opportunity to add industrial uses, uh, and, and I'm thinking clean industry, not smoke belching, you know, dirty kind of stuff, mm -hmm. uh, could allow again for more of that mixed use concept to exist where people can actually live near where they work and they can walk and they don't have to hop in the automobile. So uh, uh, definitely something that we can take a look at there and refine more. Uh, we can do a quick calculation of the areas that we have designated as vacant there. Um, uh, I'm not looking at the, the map here, photo here, you know, the one we have planned. I, I think you're going to be fine. I think you're going to be fine. And if you look at it, you know, you've got everything from the industrial side pretty much linked fairly good with 45 and some access points too. So you've, you've done some planning. You know, whether or not that was driven more by the industry, so the city would know who cares at this point, but that's, that's definitely where you put anchor down for your industrial areas and they seem to have some justification for access and good transportation routes. So we'll just take a look at that and the numbers here and see if mm -hmm. the vacant amount of vacant land that we have in those areas is uh, is uh, running in track with our projections. That uh, industrial section that you got indicated between Highway S and 54, the middle one. Yeah. Uh, remember that southern half of that we're going to have that developed as multi-family single family in that corner oh, but i think the okay. the northern half of that is is appropriate because it's a railroad spur right. that um you know we all know that um watco is going to be taking over for that that railroad um ownership of that railroad so i don't know if that's going to be more attractable for rail accessible industrial land if they can service that more but the, the northern, at least the northern, I don't know, two thirds of that would be industrial by far. Um, so you're talking about the area south of S? That one right here. Is going to be multifamily? Okay. Yeah. Just what about the. Because on the current, on the current map, yeah. Yep. On the current map, it showed as conservation, but you know, someone had sketched a circle on it. I never found a clean map. So I, somebody was playing with ideas for mm -hmm. changes already. Mm -hmm. But. No, we can show that as, as more of the high density mm -hmm. land use so that, then. It was going to be a high density and then a um, single family above that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And again, you know, uh, we can appreciate, you know, the, the last map of trying to work around a lot of existing single family residences that are a bit scattered on the front edge there. But, um, and, and no one's forcing anybody out. Uh, of their home, but but allowing for some transition to industrial should that go that way. So we thought we might clean up the map in that area and just call it all industrial. Maybe we add a little bit of additional uh, land in the secondary growth area that's now shown as residential as secondary industrial in terms of long-term expansion as well. Again, this is just initial sketch, initial thoughts, trying to match the map more to the conversation. Um, doesn't sound like we're really far off the mark. Well, at least I would want to just digest this a little bit more and put some more thought in it. I don't know how you want to get our feedback from that, whether you want us to email you ahead of time or bring it to the next meeting. I mean, how do you want to do that? I would say at least in the interim, the short term here, if you've got some other thoughts uh, or commentary similar to what you just mentioned about industrial to the south, um, just speed that stuff to Chad, um, and and you can kind of do a compilation of it or report back to us on, on what you've heard. Um, we don't want to rush this certainly, but uh, we, we do want to you know, make some decisions at some point. One, assuming we can get the, the data for your current preferred land use map, then we're going to be able to fine tune things, go in there and kind of tweak some of these um, and also calculate some of the acreages, answer some of the questions you have about demand and we have enough land. Um, and again, remember, you should be looking at this plan every 10 years at a minimum. It's not a bad practice to do an annual review, at least take a look at the map and compare to, hey, what's happening? And do we need to make some changes more frequently to the map versus the rest of the document? So always keeping up with that so you don't sell yourself short cut yourself off of, of some opportunities is always a good practice. Well, I think the other focus for us is going to be the Highway 15 corridor when that gets mm -hmm. developed. What's, what's going to happen out there? Yeah, yeah. 
And and that's that that red mark that I've got down in the southeasternmost corner there. You you've had a lot of that illustrated as secondary growth area, but now things are getting real. So basically, thought we'd take the northern part of that and probably call that a primary growth area. I do have the drawings, the details for the corridor there, and we'll make sure things match up. Um, and as best we can, we'll make sure we have the right of way for 15 on there. And any configuration changes? I think the first order of business for the planning commission is to take what Eric provided. Look at your existing land use map, which is very detailed. This is the current situation. And you know, use that to mark this as to whether or not you know you feel that there might be some changes. Like already we looked, we looked at that area on the east side by S. Uh, we may even, you know, want to cut that back a little bit in terms of industrial, create a little buffer to some of that existing residential you have there, um, and other ideas that you may have. So, yes, now's the time to, to really start honing in on the map and, and making sure that uh, what's being presented here provides you flexibility, but provides a logical use that you could envision in the future. Okay. Get those changes and start making it. That is what Eric points out is a big thing, though, Chad. Uh, trying to get that digital data for the future land use map. Got to recreate something here. That's well, I finally narrowed down the rep to talk to, so maybe he just sent the existing. I just got asked for the preferred or future from when they did it. So hopefully, I was going to suggest even that it might not make sense to say we'll be back at next month's meeting. Let's wait to see what we get and when we get it because it does take time to make these changes. If we have to redo the whole thing, it's going to take longer. If we had that data tomorrow, I'd say yeah, we could make all these other changes we're talking about in time. But um, why don't we just hold off on? Deciding whether we bring this back to the plan commission next month or the month after, but we don't. And remember, I mean, the, the charge here was just to take a look at this element because this is going to bring you the most value value for the planning commission to make land use decisions. You still have the entire comprehensive plan that needs to be updated. My discussions with Chad were to wait until the census information became available, something that we probably go to the next year's budget to wrap around the rest the the entire comprehensive plan document that being said that does provide a bit of another window to the tweak here if we find something in the other elements economic development housing those other ones that would re require a change or amendment to this we can get we can capture it in, in next year's town plan as well so we've got some safeguards built into the process here that will allow a systematic progression of your plan that brings it more and more on point as we evaluate all the other uh, components of your comprehensive plan, which would include recreation as well, you know, your trails and park locations and those. I think in the interim, you know, this should serve you pretty well or better than, than the current map um, for the short term until the rest of the plan gets updated. I think also with the changes that we show here and talking about it, it does represent fairly drastic change in terms of how you know, would view, view new development. It's not it's not just your standard commercial, residential, industrial, and we separate all that stuff. Now it's really starting to take heed that, that we need to start making these areas more integrated. We need to make them communities that, that kind of almost stand on their own a little bit uh, to, to be more walkable, reduce automobile usage, increase recreation opportunities, all of those kinds of things. So. Assuming that's the direction you want to go, I think we get in there. And other communities are doing that too. So you're not the only ones. We just want to make sure that you say the ideas. You want to go that direction. Other than that, that's pretty much what we had this evening. So, uh, any other comments or thoughts? But you'll see more of us and we'll try and. Uh, Get this part finished up, fill in the gaps in the document, and I'm hoping the next time we meet, we've got something that's a little more solid in terms of a draft with the, the necessary details in it. Uh, if we do this right, this is possibly might be comfortable enough at the next meeting to, to at least endorse it as yes, we're comfortable with that draft, and then you can 
go through the formal process of, of doing the plan amendment to incorporate this material. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Oh, thank you very much. Ed, you got an update on planning issues and other agenda items? Not really. Dave, do you got anything coming forward? I mean, there's... I have the murals and stuff that's coming up. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring yeah. that mural um, situation. Uh, Dave and I will talk to legal about um, you know, how we want to, you know, define the murals a little bit more sure. just because it's obviously way different than probably when that ordinance was built, was written, you know, so. Mm -hmm. We were saying the next meeting was going to be the 23rd, did you say? The next regularly scheduled meeting would be Thursday, enough. July 22nd. Everyone all right with that? That I say that I thought we had something else kind of earmarked for that. Give me one second. Let's see. It's about July already. It goes fast. Uh, Twenty second. Oh, um, tids. We are going to be bringing. We're, we're making those two tid districts for um, the Romanesco and the downtown development. There's going to be some tid. Um, Procedural things we got to do at that meeting. That's what's going to go on. So that'll be on the next meeting. That'll be the 22nd? 22nd. Yep. Okay, I look for a motion to adjourn. I'll so move. I'll second. Made and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We're adjourned.